Hey bag ladies and bag dudes, I'm Sarah Lawson from So Sweetness. Thanks so much for joining me for Ask Sarah, my weekly Q&A chat. So um, the main event is how to sell handmade bags. So I have a panel of five lovely ladies who sell bags across all areas. So in person at craft fairs and holiday marts, on their own websites, on Etsy, uh, through consignment, Instagram, and Facebook groups. So we've got all areas covered tonight. Super excited for this chat. And we're going to be answering your questions live during the second half of the show. So I hope you'll join us through the whole chat. It's going to be really informative and a lot of fun. So before we get started on that, as promised, uh, I have the Minikin Season 2 sneak peek for the night. Uh, every Sunday and Tuesday on the live shows through the end of October when Minikins Season 2 comes out on October 31st. Um, I'm going to have a sneak peek on every live show. So tonight's sneak peek is actually the shortest pattern of the bunch. It's called the Epicure Pouch. And it's actually only an eight step pattern. So there's only a very limited amount of fabric pieces to cut out for this project. And it's got this lovely metal frame on the top. So this is an eight inch frame. The pattern will also work with a seven and a half inch frame, which is another common size and it just opens up. Um, it's really easy to insert with screws, so perhaps if you've installed a twist lock before, it's kind of a similar application to that. And there's no pockets on the inside, but I think this would be an adorable gift, um, especially for a bridal shower, for all the bridesmaids. And I made mine with a lovely bark cloth fabric, so I feel like it has a really nice vintage vibe when um, paired with this frame. So again, this is the Epicure pouch one of the 13 patterns and videos that will be coming out October 31st in Minikin season two. All right, so let's get started. Again, tonight's topic is how to sell your handmade bags. And I have my five panelists, panelists with me today. I admit I have never sold a handmade bag, but years ago when William was a baby, so this is over 10 years ago, I did sell burp cloths on Etsy because when I learned to sew as an adult, burp cloths just being a rectangle were the only thing that I could sew at the time. I was selling them for $9 on Etsy. They were backed with Minky. They had really nice fabric on the front and I had no idea about pricing my things. I was just trying to price them low enough so that people would, would purchase them and I could at least sell some. And now I know better that that's not the best strategy. But um, as I was talking on Instagram Live, if you joined me before then, Getting paid what we're worth is really important, so that's why I wanted to have this topic tonight so we can talk about the ins and outs of selling items and um, at the end of the day, make sure that we're getting paid what we're worth. So I'm gonna introduce my lovely panel, starting with Dina. Um, before I start having everyone introduce themselves, I also wanted to remind all of you viewing out there that I have links to all of my panelists' um, shops or their main site of business in the description. So if you wanna check out their links after the show and, and see what they're doing and um, what they're making and what they're all about. Please do that after the show. Um, we'll start with Dina though. If you could tell everyone the name of your business and how long you've been selling handmade items for. Sure, thanks. Hi everybody, I'm Dina. Um, my business is DBMM, More Than a Pretty Case. And right now my website is actually, I'm switching to a new website this week, so you'll see it there, but I'm not selling anything at the ver this very moment. <laughs> Uh, but I've been making gig bags um, and for musical instruments and also straps for a little over five years. And then this year I just am now, you know, kind of shifting my focus into kind of regular bags and wallets and, you know, some things that are a little quirky and different, but not necessarily for musicians. Awesome. Thank you, Dina. All right. So we have two Christies with us tonight. Uh, we're going to start with Christy with a C. So Christy, if you could tell everyone the name of your business and how long you've been selling handmade items for. Hi, um, I'm Christy Stooldreyer. Um, I run um, Love uh, Love You So, um, and I've been selling since about 2013 um, on Etsy. Um, mainly baby items, but I throw in bags all the time. Um, I and lately a lot of bags that are shown. Um, through Instagram um, and Facebook, um, a lot of times I get a lot of inquiries uh, there as well. So I kind of sell all over, but mainly on my Etsy um, site as time allows. I'll, I'll post some extra things over there. Awesome. Thank you, Christy. All right. So next up is Bethany. So Bethany, what's the name of your business and how long have you been selling handmade items for? 
Hi, um, I've been sewing for about three years and um, the name is Five Stitches, basically just because it's my husband and I and our three girls, so oh, <laughs> just nice. went off of that. But um, yeah, just fairly common story, just started staying home with the girls and picked it up as something to do and fell in love with it. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Bethany. All right. Now the Christy with a K. Rock Baby Scissors. Um, how long have you been selling handmade items for? Um, in January, it'll be nine years. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Quite a Congratulations. While. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Uh, next is Shannon. Um, tell everyone the name of your business and how long you've been selling handmade items for. Hi. I'm Shannon. Uh, I own Shannon Created. And I've been selling handmade items for coming up on four years. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I have my own list of questions. So we're going to get to my questions first, and then we'll throw the ball out to all of you. Um, I already saw tons of really good questions in the comments. So we'll get to as many questions live as we can. So I want my, my very first question is, and again, we're going to go for the second question down the same line, uh, one at a time. But um, I want to know what type of bag or accessory is your biggest seller. So for example, um, is it a certain style of clutch, a zipper pouch? Uh, uh, what type of bag is your best seller? And Danny's going to load a couple of photos as we go through each person. So Dina, if you could tell us uh, what types of things are your best sellers, and then we'll see a couple photo examples of Dina's work up on the screen as well. Yeah, so <laughs> that's a good question. I, um, I've i been doing a lot of custom work the last five years. Those bags, one of them is for a, a, a bass guitar, the other is electric guitar. Um, a lot of people, when they want something really different, they want it to be custom. I just started making these new bags, like the one that just showed up. This has been a pretty good seller online. Oh, that's so um, But I've noticed, thanks. I've noticed that I have different bestsellers in person at fairs and stuff than I do online, like completely opposite. Um, so it's a mystery. I have some bags I've never sold at a fair, but they attract attention. So I take a bunch of them with me, and then I put them in my shop online, and they sell out in a day. So, I, you know, <laughs> it's a... Uh, Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of hard to get a, a hold of like what really sells well. Or sometimes I'll sell a bunch of ukulele bags um, all at once. I don't know why, and then none for like two months. So okay, yeah, it's kind of hard to say. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. Okay, what ab what about you, Christy? Christy with a C. What type of bag or accessory is your biggest seller? So I make I still make a lot of baby um, items. Uh, here are some just like clutches that I've sold at fairs. I don't sell that online, but I've sold them in fairs. Um, and I make like a very basic um, pouch. I mean, no interfacing, just PUL and an exterior with like some type of um, heavy duty like exterior, like a canvas or something. And it's very easy. It's fast, high margin, and it's what I've stuck to uh, ma mainly because it's high margin, low um, a low amount of time, but at fairs, if I do like a craft fair, um, I will sell like these little coin pouches, which you just use scraps for, um, because people that just walk around and lots of times kids come by, they pick up these little coin pouches and it's just like one like the nice things. And of course, like, um, actually I just did one, what is it, last weekend, sold all of my motos. <laughs> <laughs> The large side motos, I sold all those because I always pair them with cork and people just like them. Um, and just anything different. It's funny, like one of the things that a husband had mentioned, he was like, wow, there's a lot of different ways to make a pouch, aren't there? <laughs> and it, it me up because it's like, yeah, there's definitely a lot of different ways. And so anything that has always been a little bit different or um you know, just a different shape. They always tend to sell a lot uh, faster in person. Yeah, online, I just don't post a lot of them. I post like my basic offering online, but I have had um, baby bags, like large um, sizable baby bags sell online that I couldn't sell in person because they were so expensive. So when you, when you mentioned about throwing, uh, there was something different in the pouches that you were selling in person, like we saw that picture with a little bit of leather in there. Is is that what you mean by throwing something high Yeah, just like a different there? shape. Okay. Yeah, a different style. Of course, the cork is um, a big seller. 
um, just because it's still so different, even though we as bag ladies and, and bag dudes have seen it all the, you know, seen it for a while, um, the market hasn't. And so when they come across that, um, the people just, they are just floored and they always want to know the background, what is core, you know, um, is it like the wine, you know, the stuff in the wine. And, um, you know, especially if you have like the fun um, rainbow stuff, it really attracts like kids and a lot of, um, and a lot of people that come to these type of markets because they're always looking for something different. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Christy. All right, so what about you, Bethany? Um, what type of bag or accessory is your biggest seller? Uh, mine is just a very simple wristlet um, that I self, it's just a self-drafted pattern, but very simple. Um, and the two-tone one there that's pictured is definitely the most popular, um, but it's a very, very fast sew for me. And so I, I try to keep it at a low price point so that it's a good gift for people to buy as gifts. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's a very quick sew for me. And I, I love making it because you can make the combination anything that you want. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, try to keep yourself interested while you're sewing so many, right? That's important right. too. All right, how about you, Christy, uh, Rock Baby Scissors? What is uh, your best seller? Um, definitely right now, project bags. Um, sew together or bionic gear bags. And then what's on the screen now, the Rockstar bag. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're definitely the Rockstar bag. I made the first one and it just, people went crazy for it. So, and I think I just posted one yesterday in your Facebook group. It was number 84. Oh my gosh. And I have another one on my table that's finished right now, um, minus the inside binding. And then I have another one that I have to make tomorrow. So. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I actually have a sew together bag uh, from Christy. So I can see that, that that would be popular in her shop and also the craft bags. I've seen you on Instagram making a lot of craft bags lately. Those look really cool. Oh yeah, tons awesome. of them. Okay, so what about you, Shannon? What is your best seller? I find that my best sellers tend to go in cycles. Um, right now, it's mostly backpack and sling bags. Um, that backpack right there on the screen um, is definitely a popular one these days, especially with school coming back in session. Um, I have uh, found that the park hopping bags, like these ones, uh, this size, has been very popular lately, um, but it does tend to cycle. So right now it's it's backpacks and sling bags and wallets are always good too. Awesome, awesome. Okay, all right, so let's, let's get on to some more questions. Um, my next question is, how did you decide how to price your item? So let's, let's kind of change it up, the order up a little bit. Um, let's start with you, Shannon. How did, how did you decide how to price your items? And I know you use a lot of custom fabrics, so does that change things for you? at all um yeah it, it does i use um a lot of like you said a lot of custom printed fabric which costs me more and therefore that that does end up being passed on um in my price point for me it is a matter of determining how long something takes me to make um you know we need to be paid for our hourly wage for our labor that's i mean anybody can buy the fabric but we bring our our uh our talent and our time to it and so I will often see what the, part of it is what the market will support too whether or not I'm even to sell something um, I wish I had like a formula for you some of these other ladies probably do they're probably better at pricing than I yeah, am yeah that's a good that's a good point does anyone on the panel use a certain formula like a hard formula um, based on uh, hours and cost of materials does anybody use a formula mm. You do? Kind of okay. do. Yeah. I have, well, I'm kind of a dork, so I have, I have spreadsheets. Awesome. <laughs> and I, I like put in my supplies that I have my little drop downs. And so at that, I see, okay, you know, how much are all of my supplies going to cost? And I count like okay. every rivet, rectangle ring, whatever, because those little things, this is what I noticed when I was not, when I was just kind of picking like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll do a hundred dollars or whatever. Um, but then I tend to like overcomplicate things. I'm like, oh, but it would look cool if I just added this and you know added that and put this and that and that. And then by the end of it, you've added like twenty dollars worth of you know extra hardware. So yeah, I keep track of all that um, and time. And I actually just recently also 
um, I was like, you know, if I'm going to be a business and not just because I'm not a wage worker, I'm not just working for my my own wages. I have to also invest in my business. And so I, I joked, but seriously said, I now put in an extra percentage um, for reinvestment so that I can actually buy a new machine or you know upgrade my equipment in some way or um, just all those little things that don't make it into the price normally. So yeah, I, I now do everything in my spreadsheet. Because <laughs> I've heard in the past, and I don't know if this is like a just a myth, but I've heard cost of supplies times three. Does that seem kind of on track with um, your pricing or anyone else in the group um, pricing? Yes, I've, I've <laughs> definitely heard of using that. Cost of materials times three, okay. Uh -huh. That's a good rule of thumb, but you should really track everything. I'm a spreadsheet girl too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, like, and I know that we buy things like on sale, some is like, full retail and then you know there's like different prices so I do um, an average of how much I okay. spend okay um, I know some people only put in retail amounts but I want like I actually want to know like what what my, my real margins are and, and take that into account but like I always also take when pricing like I also take into the into account the entire um, portfolio because there are certain things that you that you can make a much higher margin on, and there's some things that, like, if you use your calculation, you're like, yeah, the market's not going to be able to bear it. You okay. know, they think the price out. So I try to balance out because there's some things that, like, I have a ridiculous margin on, and that's why I keep making it. And then then I can um, go a little bit lower in some areas. Like um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna it. guess, I'm gonna guess the zipper pouches that you mentioned were your high margin, and your baby bags probably your low margin. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Oh, yeah. All right. So while we're we're kind of moving in the direction of my next question, and Christy kind of touched on that, but I want to also know: Do you purchase supplies at wholesale, wholesale only, a combination of wholesale and retail, or only retail, and why? So let's let's start with. Um, Christy with a K. So are you buying supplies wholesale at all or how, how, how is that working for you? Um, interfacing in hardware is all um, you know, in, bought in bulk, including needles, oil for my machine, um, all, all supplies really. Um, but fabric, no. Um, fabric I buy retail, usually from like Hawthorne Threads or you know somewhere like that, just because I've, I've never been able to pay that upfront cost of starting, you know, the $1,500 flat you need upfront to get an account. So I've always just done the fabric retail, but everything else is bought in bulk. Okay. I mean, like hundreds of pieces at a time. Would you mind sharing your source where you're buying your hard purse hardware from? Um, I get rectangle rings and some swivel clasps from Tantalizing Stitches on okay. Etsy. Um, I get my magnetic snaps on Amazon because they are crazy cheap. Um, woven interfacing from Got Interfacing, my flex foam, you know, by the 60 inch um, on the big roll from Overstock because it's crazy cheap. And yeah, everything awesome. else is just, you know, Etsy or Amazon, random little stores here and there. Ning Bags has some really, really fancy hardware, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Um, how about you, Bethany? Um, I buy my zippers wholesale, um, and then honestly, for I buy my cork from you. <laughs> yep. And then um, the inside is usually just a basic lining. I usually don't do a whole lot for it, so it's just any fabric that I can find, and it can be mm -hmm. random for what I do. So I use my, you know. Coupons wisely at Joann's gotcha. and we'll just buy a bulk of something on 60% coupon or something. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. So. Awesome. Okay. How about you, Shannon? I know you're buying the custom fabrics, but are you buying other supplies wholesale? I do. I, um, I am another one that uses God Interfacing for my interfacing. I buy that in bulk. Um, I do buy wholesale through Emmeline. Um, I love her hardware. It's Beautiful. That to me has been trying to find the balance um, because you want high quality hardware, not just cheap hardware. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
<laughs> so I definitely get some on Etsy. Purse Supplies RS on Etsy sells really nice uh, flat cast uh, strap sliders and things like that that I like. Um, my fabric, a lot of it is the custom fabric, so that's anywhere from you know $22 to $35 a yard. So that really depends on um, what that is. I don't, I don't buy that wholesale, but uh, yep, I do buy my interfacing and my hardware in bulk and wholesale when I can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like across the board, certain things everyone's buying wholesale and others like the custom fabric um, paying the full price for. Um, and there's a few other points that I wanted to touch on. I mentioned at the beginning of the chat that uh, basically everyone on the panel is selling items in different ways. Like they have different focus like uh, consignment, Facebook group. Um, and I wanted to start with you on this question, Shannon. So. Can you explain a little bit about um, what your focus is and how do you like doing that? And because it's the Facebook group, I thought that was really interesting. Um, is it a private group and how do you conduct selling your items in the Facebook group? I, it is not a private group, it's a public group, although I do have to approve members so that I can, you know, you get weird requests sometimes. I mean, you know, you run yeah. a Facebook group. Um, so I do have member approval on, but it is um, it is a public group, and I I did sell on Etsy for a while, but I found that my traffic was uh, going lower, and I like the Facebook group because people can have their notifications on, and they can um, they can see you know when they want to see it when what I'm selling. I do my custom stocking, my custom slot stockings on Facebook, which is really nice. Um, it kind of a first come first serve. And then I also do ready to ship sales and it gives me the opportunity to uh, give people a heads up before something is is posted. So I can post two or three days in advance, hey, be here at 8 p.m. my time and I'm gonna load you know, what I have ready to ship and you can come on and claim it. Um, and so it's it's been a really great platform for me to sell. Um, I do some on Instagram, not a lot, but uh, it's been a great opportunity for me to interact with my customers. Um, and be able to um, really figure out what they want and and what the best way to uh, sell what they are looking for. So I have a follow-up question to that. When you said custom stocking, does that just mean you post in the group that you have different slots for custom orders, or what, what exactly does that entail? Yeah, that's actually been a little bit nuts this year. I mean, as, uh, as I've been selling longer, my customer base has grown, which is great, but there's only one of me um, and so I can only take so many custom orders. And so I do every eight weeks or so, I'll open up some, I call them custom slots. So sometimes I will open up um, slots for like, okay, I'm going to sell, I'm going to take orders for X number of Speedwell, this bag. Okay. Um, but when I open up my custom slots, it's, um, I will, you know, anything with you want with whatever fabric you would like. So it's not limited to bag type or uh, fabric type or anything like that. It's just a, a open, um, you can order whichever bag you would like. And is that at a flat rate since they're choosing whatever fabrics they want and potentially the hardware? Do you price them based on whatever things that they're adding that might be extra or more expensive? I do. I have, uh, I have an album in my group. I have a photo album mm -hmm. of kind of a basic price list um for because i do sell more than one kind of bag um and so it's it's a price list of this is the basic price if you want to add custom fabric it's this much more if you want to add uh you know rainbow hardware it's this much more if you want to add so it, it does um it, it's a starting point at least for people and okay. with my custom slots i'm able to talk with people one-on-one -on -one, uh so that if they do want to add something you know more customized then I do adjust the price accordingly, you know, depending okay. on how much more work and how much more cost goes into it. Okay. Oh, good. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that information. Okay. So how about you? How about you, Christy? Christy, rock, baby, scissors. Um, what's your, what's your uh, focus area and how's that working out for you? I really don't have, you know, me and Dina are actually talking the other night and she's going to help me, you know, get my own little spreadsheet going because I really just kind of throw a price at the wall and see how the item sells. There is no rhyme or reason behind my pricing. I don't know. 
Is there a certain, I usually just, is there a certain area on the internet that you sell the best on, like for example, Instagram or? Uh, I only sell on Etsy anymore. On Etsy? I try to keep okay. all on one platform. If someone messages me on Facebook or Instagram or emails, I'm like, send me, you know, a message on Etsy. I like to keep it all in one place. Um, but yeah, Dana actually just talked to me into upping the prices on, you know, some of my more structured bags. She's like, you are really lowballing yourself, you know, that's why you're broke all the time. You know? <laughs> so yeah, because, you know, I was just, you know, laying everything out for, you know, and she said that she would help me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where I'm going wrong and what I'm doing right. Yeah, because you sell a lot of very detailed, very detailed bags. I do. I yeah. And I, I think 85% about of my workload is customs. So I just, I want to make sure I'm paying myself what I should be paying myself. Okay. All right. Good point. All right. So what about you, Bethany? Um, where is your focus as far as where you're selling the best and how's that working for you? Um, I, I mostly like to deal with um, shops that are within my area so that I can, I like to just kind of walk into stores and see what a shop is like and if I could make something that would fit their store. So um, I do a lot of just blind calls and we'll take in a couple, you know, some of my product that I've done. And then if I feel like I don't have something that would fit that shop, I'll get an idea of what, what they do sell and then I'll just make something and take it back in and say, you know, would you be interested in this? And um, most businesses, the standard is 50% um, wholesale for mm -hmm. if they buy it from me or even consignment. Um, so that scares a lot of people when you are talking about selling bags, but I, I tend to make products that I know I could sell for 50% because I, it's such a good um, area where I live to just find little niche shops and boutiques and um, so there's a lot of opportunities, but you gotta have to expect that it's gonna be 50%. So I, that's why I try to keep my items to small, quick projects. And I think I saw, I think I saw from your Facebook page, because I follow you on Facebook, <laughs> uh, Hallmark, I, I believe, is one of the store types right. of stores that you sell to. So I thought that was very yes. interesting. Yeah, um, it's actually based in Kansas City, the headquarters here. And what so they really have, yeah. Um, so there's several Hallmark stores around here in Kansas City, and um, they've really taken an interest in local vendors. So right now they're, they do focus on, and they really enjoy taking on local vendors. Um, but again, that's, that is a 50% thing. And so I try to, what I make with them, I make sure that it could be something I could still make a profit with, but still be really quick to make. And okay. Anyway, so that's, that's why the wristlets are such a, Oh, that's thing very interesting. So they, do they yeah. um, call or email you their orders when they need to reorder? How does that work? Um, with just... them, it's just consignment. And so I'm okay. able to take what I want. And, and honestly, it works out great because I can test out products. And then um, there's also a local store called Made in KC mm -hmm. that also does local vendors. Um, but they buy from me wholesale. So it works out great to be able to test out stuff with Hallmark and then... Oh, you know, I see. whatever works, I can try with the other store. Gotcha. And, uh, anyway, I love I love um, mass production, and <laughs> I like being able to just make twenty or thirty of something at once, and okay. it goes so fast. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you, and that's very interesting yeah. about the consign consignment. So, um, Christy from Love You So actually has to leave us in two minutes. Um, Christy, before you leave, I was wanting to ask you. Uh, what do you feel is the most important thing that you've learned as a seller? So is it about uh, pricing your items? Is it about coming, maybe coming up with the best type of item? Or is it about the social media? What do you think is for you the most important thing that you've learned that has helped you grow as a seller of handmade items? I think um, patience. Uh, it takes a while. It takes a while to, you know, build up your credibility for people to like understand the quality that you are um, putting in into your bags. So sometimes it, you know, not everyone can see it online. Um, I get a lot of people in person and once they see like the quality, then they understand, you know, mm -hmm. some of the pricing. Um, and then, you know, then it's like the word of mouth that that comes in, but that and just to enjoy what you like, because I, 
I mean, I've made a lot of things, but I don't, I mean, I've made a lot, but I sell very little. <laughs> and, um, there has to be some type of enjoyment in it um, because I, yeah, there's certain things that I just, uh, once um, it's asked of me, then I lose some of the enjoyment. And so I picked certain things uh, where I know I can make it churn and burn it and I still enjoy. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Christy. Thanks for being oh, in the thanks, chat. Thanks for having me. I got to put the babies to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Christy. Goodbye. Okay, so I'm going to ask this ne next question to the panel as a group and feel free, whoever has uh, the answer to the question. I'd like to know, do you have a lot of repeat customers? I have a yeah. few. <laughs> there are a few names. Um, she actually just put an order in again last night. But yeah, I have, um, I think, three or four ladies that I'll see their name, you know, every couple months. So, oh, and awesome. it's really fun to know that they like your stuff enough that they just keep coming back. It's, it's a big compliment. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've had several people too that um, musicians tend to play a lot of instruments or have more than one of the same instrument even. Um, so I've had people come back. I, I tease them if they have collections now um, of you know gig bags. I wonder what they look like you know going through an airport or something with my gig bags. Um, but it's been fun too that now that I've you know I'm trying to do this switch over. I'm kind of in the middle of switching over to these sort of regular bags. Um, and a lot of my gig bag customers were have been my very first regular bag customers. So, oh, awesome. yeah, they've, yeah, yeah. I have some people. I think my the record is six bags. One person with six bags. Although two of those I think were gifts. Yeah. So she has four herself, and then two were for her boyfriend. Awesome. <laughs> I do have quite a few uh, repeat customers, but I find that because I I offer. Um, several different bag styles and I try to come out with a new bag style every now and then that um, people they want to try the new bag and so I do have quite a few repeat customers okay so I'm gonna jump over to my next question um, if you do custom orders uh, the first part of the question is what is your lead time uh, meaning the time it takes you to from when they request the order till when you deliver it and do you take a percentage down, for example, 50% down when they order it and 50% down when they complete it, or do you take the whole money amount up front? Uh, we'll start with you, Sh Shannon, since you're st still on the screen. Um, I, when I take a custom order, uh, I do custom orders in two different ways. Um, so when I take a custom order, my lead time is, at the beginning of the year, it's like six to eight weeks. This time of year, it's more like 12. Um, just for Christmas orders, um, it gets busy. Um, so I will, uh, and I do require full payment up front. Um, and then when I do the custom fabric, I'll often take a pre-order for the fabric. And of course, the, I, those of you that are in the custom fabric world know that it takes the fabric anywhere from like 12 to 16 weeks to get to me. So in that case, I do take a 50% deposit. I require a 50% deposit up front with the rest due when I have fabric in hand. Um, so my, my lead time, part of it depends on the time of year, um, but it, it's right around, it averages about eight weeks for um, okay. customers. Awesome. What about you, Bethany? What's your lead time and do you take a percentage down when you're doing uh, orders or custom orders? Yeah, I do require full payment. Um, and if it's people I know, I tend to not be as hard about that. Um, but I usually give about a six week lead time. Okay. All right. How about that, you? That's oh. just fitting in them with other, like the stores. Cause okay. Yeah. Awesome. What the, about you? The stores are the priority for me. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. What about you, Dina? Uh, what's your lead time and do you take uh, yeah. full payment? Full payment up front. Um, my lead times vary, but I, you know, I'll take, I'll take customs just for a certain amount of time. And I also kind of differentiate between custom and made to order. So made to order is a, a model or design I already have, you know, drafted out. I've already designed it, and they're just choosing their fabrics from my collection. Okay. Um, so those will be a little bit faster, but usually I, you know, about four bags later than I should, I'll stop taking <laughs> customer made to order <laughs> because I realize my lead time has just gotten ridiculous, and I'm like, oh, I got to catch up. So I'm really bad at this actually. <laughs> Though I continue five years, I'm still bad at it. So. All right. What about you, Chrissy? 
Um, yeah, like I said, a lot of my workload is custom. My lead time is six to eight weeks normally. Um, you know, natural disasters like hurricanes, you know, can put you a, a little bit behind. So. Okay, so I had two more items and then we're going to open it up to questions from the live audience. Um, my two questions were, do you use licensed fabric for your items? And the second part of the question was, do you use uh, social media tools like the Etsy seller app if you saw on Etsy or um, if you promote listings like on Facebook? So um, let's just go back down the line. Uh, we'll start again with Christy. Um, do you use licensed fabric and do you use uh, social media tools? I use licensed fabric when requested for custom orders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Etsy's going to yank your shop if you get, you know, too many violations. So, like, I don't sell anything, you know, Marvel, Doctor Who, anything like that, you know, is a ready to ship. Um, you know, I, I think I'm trying to sell off the last of the stock that I have made up, but, you know, mostly it's just whatever the person wants and it's all designer fabric, so it's free to use um, and you won't get in trouble. So. Um, and I do use the, the Etsy app. Um, I'm big on Instagram. I love Instagram. Um, I have my Instagram then post stuff to Facebook now because I kept forgetting to post, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stuff on Facebook. Um, but yeah, I love I love the social media aspect of it. And my I think my business has grown because of it. You know, and I try to stay really active and, you know, make friends with, you know, the fabric designers and other bag makers, you know, and just you know, build those good relationships. Yeah, I think the relationships are really important. I know Allison Glass, uh, you have a relationship with her in regards to getting new fabric and all that, right? Yeah, sometimes. And me and Chin text here and there, and, you know, that's always really exciting. And, you know, and, and then I've become friends with you, and, you know, we've talked on the phone like normal people, and, you know. and <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. And, yep. It's, it's a lot of fun, you know, whenever someone asks you to make something, you know, with their fabric or their new bag pattern, it's, it, it's really good. It, it's nice for me, you know, to know that I've worked hard on cultivating these relationships and building my brand and people are trusting my brand. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really important. That's really good. And uh, Christy mentioned the Etsy seller app, even though I don't sell handmade items, I sell cork fabric and other things on and patterns and on Etsy. The Etsy seller app is huge. I try to update my Etsy seller app every day, which the Etsy seller app has an aspect of social media to it. So I post an update, which is a photo kind of like an, I feel like it's kind of like an Instagram photo. And that photograph is um, sent out to all the people that follow my shop on Etsy. So that's a really important tool. I noticed the difference when I wasn't posting for about two months uh, as far as my Etsy sales, even though Etsy isn't my biggest proportion of sales. I noticed when I wasn't posting on the Etsy seller app and when I did post again, the sales went back up. So that's super important if you're looking to sell on Etsy. Um, but let me get that question over to, to the other three on the panel. Um, Bethany, um, do you use any portions of social media and um, do you l use licensed fabric? Um, I use Instagram and Facebook. Um, as far as licensed fabric, it's just if it's requested. Okay. Um, but not typically. I do make like some Kansas City Royal keychains, you know, but okay. awesome. <laughs> not unless it's specifically requested. I don't. Okay. All right. What about you, Dina? Um, no. So everything I make is um, with those Flisco, you know, the Dutch wax print mm -hmm. fabrics. So that's, you know, my, my thing, my niche. Um, I do get requests sometimes. I usually say no. The only sort of fabric I ever did once was for a, um, a kid's uh, music class, and the parents all got together to get a guitar case for the teacher using the kid's artwork. So that's not licensed fabric, but that was my one exception in five and a half years. Um, and as far as social media, yeah, I, I like Instagram. I've been really trying to, like, I've been a bad Instagrammer for several years now, but I'm really trying now to post, you know, at least a few times a week. And I have gotten, um, I'm actually moving off of Etsy. It's been nice while I've been there, but I'm actually moving off of Etsy um, because I realized that I was driving my own 
customers like that I got through Facebook or Instagram or in person to Etsy. And so then you get into that thing of, wait a minute, I'm paying the fees, but I'm the one, you know. So I, I just saw my organic sort of reach on Etsy drop um, a lot with some of these policy changes. So yeah, it's a, uh, it'll be sad, but I'm moving more to Instagram and Facebook and, and off of Etsy. That's a good point that Dina made. Etsy has the fees, the seller fees, as well as the fees for you know the payments. And so Dina made a good point she was posting to Instagram and Facebook and or in person and sending people to Etsy where she would have to pay these fees. So that's a really good point. And on that note, we're gonna jump to the live questions. Danny's gonna put some questions on the screen. Um, I, I know there's tons of really meaty questions coming through. Um, Jennifer says, how do you manage your, sell, your raw goods inventory? So the goods that you're using for your custom orders, does anyone have a system as far as managing that? and what you have in stock? I just go by site. All my hardware is in clear drawers on the thing behind me, I think behind my head. <laughs> um, but yeah, if something isn't full, I order it. If my foam is getting low, I order it. I don't have any, you know, I don't keep track of anything electronically. Okay, I admit I do the same thing with my cork and all that stuff. Does anyone use a spreadsheet? as far as keeping track of their inventory? I'm bad about that too. I just keep the little sticker, you know, that has like, it says what it is on the front of the bin and then like Christy said, it gets low. I go, okay, okay. <laughs> take the sticker down and order more. Yeah, that sounds easy. Okay, Dan, you wanna post another? I saw you had another one up there a second ago. Esta says, uh, what payment style do you use? Do you use PayPal, Square, or something else? I'm assuming everyone uses PayPal, right? Is that correct? Right. Yeah. I use it, PayPal because, I mean, I think for the same reason everybody does. It has buyer and seller protection on both sides that you don't get with Square or um, anything else. I mean, Etsy does have its own seller and buyer protection, which is great too if they use the Etsy checkout. But um, for me, I use PayPal exclusively. Does anyone use anything Square. besides PayPal? Oh, sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, Square in person, actually. Um, they, I don't know if it's still going on, but it might be. You can um, check through their website or through Etsy even, because now they're associated with Square. Um, but they had a, a, a deal recently where your first $1,000 um, in fees, not in sales, in fees is uh, waived when you sign up. And so I did that. So all summer, I haven't been paying fees. Um, when I sell at, you know, craft fairs and festivals and things like that. So I've That's been using awesome. Square. Yeah. So if anyone isn't familiar with Square, because I use it when I teach at an in-person event, Square is a little um, credit, card reader. credit card reader that you use with your cell phone and it gives you the ability to swipe or if the card, credit card has a chip, uh, insert the chip into your credit card reader and you can take payments in person and it's really nice because um, it's kind of like you have your own little cash register with you, well, as far as credit card payments. Um, I think the fees for Stripe are uh, about the same as PayPal. Um, last I checked it was, um, I think, 30 cents a transaction and then 2.9% of the, the, your intake fee. So um, uh, really reasonable and easy to use for, for taking payments in person. Okay. Uh, Manuela says, you guys are inspiring question. I want, want to open a shop to Etsy. Do you recommend Etsy or a personal website? I personally just um, started my own website just due to fees and I like being able to just personalize it, and make it my own. But it, it equals out to be about the same in the long run and I feel like it's more, um, just professional looking to have your own website. Do you feel the traffic um, that you, you're sending over to your own website is due to your social work on social media? Do you feel like that's accurate? Okay. Yes, and I feel like on places like Etsy, if they were to go to look for a wristlet, you type in wristlet on Etsy and they could end up on somebody else's shop <laughs> instead of your own. So I feel like you, you open yourself up to competitors if you are on Etsy or other other sites. Okay. Whereas with my site, you know, they just come, they're coming strictly for my product. Yeah, that makes sense. What about you, Christy? I had a little bit of an issue. I had my own website. Like, I own my domain, um, you know, and I had my online store up, 
I tried first with GoDaddy and then with Weebly, built really nice, pretty stores. I didn't sell anything for almost a year on my website. So I finally just stopped, you know, I stopped paying the fees. It seemed like everyone wanted to go to Etsy because Etsy is what people know for handmade items. Okay. So, so they're that's familiar why with just, it. They feel comfortable using the website. I gotcha. Exactly. I gotcha. Okay. All right. I see another question coming through from Donna Lynn. Um, she says postage is so expensive. Is USPS or UPS or FedEx the best or cost effective? Uh, do you know what do you use? Um, you know, I use a combination of, I mostly use the postal service, um, but sometimes with large heavy packages, if they're going far enough across the country, um, then UPS will be less. But I, I, if I have a large package, I'll check both. But for as the default, I usually just use um, the postal service. Okay. And we get the, you know, we get discounts between either through Etsy or also PayPal. And there's even a way, even if you haven't done a transaction through PayPal, um, if you just Google it, you can find that you can still actually print shipping labels through PayPal, um, which is nice because then you'll get that commercial rate uh, for the shipment. So use that. I used to do that in the past. I believe the website is uh, paypal.com backslash uh, ship now. I believe ship that's now. It. I think yeah. so. Uh, Shannon, what are you using for shipping your finished bags? I use uh, pretty much exclusively USPS. My packages, um, I have shipped a couple of really big orders, heavy orders with UPS, but as a rule, um, USPS is the most cost effective and um, I do ship quite a bit internationally and UP USPS is still the most cost effective uh, for me, even internationally. Okay. Uh, what about same you? Here. Yeah, you, you too, Christy. What about you, Bethany? Yes, yeah, same here. Okay. Yeah, I, we ship, um, obviously, if you've gotten a package from us, you'll, you'll notice we ship USPS as well. We use uh, stamps.com, so there's a plug-in for our website, but you can also use their service separately. Um, and yeah, but that's what we personally use for shipping. Okay. Uh, Tamara says, thank you all for the great info. If this is your main job, how many hours a week do you find yourself sewing to keep up with meeting orders when this uh, business is steady. That's a great question. Uh, Bethany, since you're on the screen, you want to answer that one first? How many hours a week? Sure. Um, I fortunately get to stay home already just because I still have a couple small girls at home, but um, it's probably about, it's a good maybe four or five hours a day that I'll spend just breaking it up. It's not all at one time, but you know, they'll play for an hour and also they'll take a nap for an hour and also, and then in the evenings, usually a couple hours. So, okay. It's usually broke up. It's never all at one Yeah, one that time. makes sense. Yeah. What usually about, several hours a day. What about you, Christy? How many hours a day? That question kind of made me laugh, and probably for sad reasons. <laughs> um, I am... Sewing is both my work and my hobby. I love it. I sew for probably nine or ten hours a day. Um, and at night, if I'm bored, I will get up and sew. If uh, the boyfriend is gaming, if he's out doing mm -hmm. something, um, I will start sewing. You know, I've, I've worked till 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning sometimes. I've put in 16, 17-hour days, so I'm, I'm probably not a person people should strive to <laughs> be like when it comes to working. Do you, I have do, a, do you take the weekends off, or is that not uh, an issue for you? Yeah. I probably shouldn't answer that question. <laughs> I, I work an insane amount. I, I really do. But this is my job. This is my money. This is my livelihood. This is how I pay my bills. This is how I feed my kids. So I don't see it as overworking. I see it as me busting my butt to provide for me and my kids. Yep. So I hear you. I'm on the I same page. Yep. How about you, Dina? So I... I, I do have also another job, so I'm a researcher, and um, and I do contract stuff, like consulting, so sometimes I'll be really busy with that stuff, and I, I might only sew a couple days a week, um, and then I have periods where I'm not doing that, and so then this becomes my main job, and then, yeah, it could be a lot of overtime, a lot of hours, <laughs> 
um, sewing. But I don't know. I, I've always been one of those people I want to stay up at night. You know, at 5 o'clock in the evening, I'm like, oh, I'm going to stay up and I'm going to finish that bag. And and then, you know, I put my daughter to bed and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's me. You know, every once in a while before a fair or a festival, something in person, I'll like, I'm like, yeah, I made it till 10, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, yeah, like I just don't have that <laughs> that yeah. uh, late night gene. I used well, to, not I wish anymore. I could... yeah, it's gone. It's gone. What about you, Shannon? How many uh, hours a day? Or oh, uh, I'm with Christy. I probably shouldn't answer that question. People would be <laughs> horrified. Um, I'm gonna go with all of them. That's how many hours a day that I. <laughs> <laughs> like I sew. Uh, right, it's probably a bad time of year to ask me that question because I am neck deep in like Christmas Yeah, Christmas work. stuff, yeah. I am working a solid 12 hours a day right now. Mm -hmm. um, but normally, um, I only sew when my kids are in school, so it's about probably six or seven hours. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Uh, Chris says, uh, do you have a business license or um, LLC? Um, Shannon, what do you? I do you have a business. Okay. I am not an LLC, um, but I do have a, a, my business license and all the tax paperwork, all that taken care of. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Bethany? I do. It was a requirement for some of the stores that I was in. So. Okay. Uh, Christy. Um, yes, my name is trademarked, so I paid for that. Um, I have my business license, you know, my federal tax ID, my state tax. I pay a lot of taxes. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is legit. Awesome. How about you, Dina? Yep. Also, business license. I was an LLC for a few years, and then I, it just didn't seem like it made much of a difference for my, you know, niche, so I let that go. But still the business license. Yeah, I don't think I had an LLC for the first two or three years. I, I think the advice that I got was hold off on the LLC until uh, you were more established because the LLC does have its uh, upfront costs as well as yearly costs. And yep. um, you want I, I guess you want to make sure that you're where you want to be and you want to continue doing it before you file for that because then there's extra expenses that come with the LLC. That's my viewpoint at least. Yeah. Um, Betty says, what do you use to manage taxes or any other software that you like to use, like maybe QuickBooks? So for, for me, I use QuickBooks online. Um, I tried to do it myself, but I could not because I'm not a numbers person, so we have a bookkeeper. Um, does anybody else use QuickBooks or something different? I use QuickBooks. Um, I like that I use it online too. I like that it's cloud computing, so I don't have to have it all stored on my own system, which is nice for storage space and things like that so and it's nice that it exports to all of the tax software that I use um, I use GoDaddy okay. um, and my mom's an accountant so at the end of the year I just send everything to her so nice. awesome. <laughs> yeah I also use QuickBooks it's nice because uh, I was also using GoDaddy and then I did my taxes um, with TurboTax and if you do the self-employed with TurboTax, they actually give you a free QuickBooks self-employed um, account. So that was nice. And then it all just plugs in at tax time. So yeah. Is everybody doing their ta their books month on a monthly basis, or how often are you going in there and actually? Uh, I know there's like an automatic export. I see Christy laughing, so I don't know if I should hey, or I shouldn't sh ask you. <laughs> I should stay on top of it a little bit more, but. You know, like if I'm using personal money, like if I don't have my PayPal um, business card with me or something like that, and I'll just use cash or my debit card, I'll keep the receipts in this special pocket of my wallet, and I probably should, you know, add them into my bookkeeping on a weekly or monthly basis, but no, I usually wait till January or February, and then it's like that mad crunch, like, oh no, I have... 50 receipts in my wallet, so let's go and, you know, spend two days adding everything in. So I could be more on top of it, but at least I save the receipts, you know, I have the information. So that's why you should get a business account. That's one thing I would definitely recommend for people. It doesn't cost anything. Um, open business bank accounts because then if you use a bookkeeping thing like, you know, GoDaddy or QuickBooks or whatever, 
um, you just link your business accounts to it and it automatically populates. And so all I have to do is go in every couple weeks and it will have some transactions that it doesn't know how to categorize. And I just say, oh, okay, anything that comes from So Sweetness is supplies or whatever. And then in the future, it will always categorize that um, correctly. And it's just so much easier. Um, and it's not all mixed in with your personal finances. I cannot stress that enough because when I first started my business, I was using my personal account for personal and business. Um, and it, it was a nightmare and it cost me a lot of money to have a bookkeep, actually an accountant, get everything straightened out. Please do yourself a favor, have a separate account at your bank for business and separate account for personal and keep them separated. So uh, don't be using your personal account for you know going to Joann's, use your business account, get a separate card. It's really important. I know it sounds like a simple thing, but literally it costs me a lot of money to get it straightened out and fixed. And um, many days spent with tears just because it was taking so long and took a lot of my time also. So yeah, just keep everything separate. Do yourself a favor. I, I guess I know what I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Jacqueline says, for the online sellers, what kind of overhead costs do you have to run your site and advertise? So. I know I'm not selling handmade bags, but um, there's hosting for the website. Uh, we have plugins on the website that do different things that cost money. Um, once in a while, we do an advert on Facebook that costs money. Does anybody else use other things that I haven't mentioned or want to elaborate on what other costs that are involved for any kind of online selling? I've done a few promoted listings here and there, but other than that, I don't do too much advertising. I actually just got an email from um, Google AdWords that I hadn't spent any money with them in 15 months, so they closed out my account. Um, I don't. I don't like to pay too much to advertise. You know, I'll I'll post when I'm having a sale here and there, and it either works or it doesn't. You know. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say is just to remember, um, like if you're pricing your stuff for online sales or whatever, just to remember to include things like, oh, okay, you're going to give PayPal 3%, you're going to give Etsy 5%, you're going to, you know, just those, because those little things kind of sneak up on you and then you realize at the end of the month or the year, like, oh, but because in your head you go, oh, I'm making $85 off of that, but really you're making 76 or whatever. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, those little things. And make sure you account for your shipping supplies. Yeah. Your coupon cards, if you do those, your business cards, your clear poly bags, your mailing poly bags. Sure, you know, UPS or USPS will send you a lot of their priority boxes for free. But, I mean, you have to account for all the other stuff. Ribbon and wrapping paper, if you tie your stuff up really pretty, you know, that has to be accounted into your shipping costs. And, unfortunately, I didn't. that didn't occur to me until this year, but I have a $1 handling fee on all of my items, you know, to go towards the poly bags and business cards and all that good stuff. Interesting. Um, another question, how do you trademark your name and logo? Does anyone have their stuff trademarked? I do. Um, you do it through your individual state and it's something you have to upkeep. I know in Louisiana it was yearly. I'm not sure. I, we just moved um, to South Carolina four months ago. I haven't done it here yet, so I'm not sure what the maintenance is here. Okay. It's usually really cheap. I know in Louisiana it was very cheap to get trademarked. Okay. Excellent. Um, I see a question from Lisa coming through. Um, MailChimp and keeping email lists with advertising. So does anyone use uh, a newsletter to send out information to their customers? And if you do, which one? I don't use one. <laughs> I don't either. Uh, okay. Well. It, I, I use uh, MailChimp is a good one. Um, I use Mad Mimi just because uh, the pricing, uh, once you get a lot of uh, newsletter subscribers, was cheaper for Mad Mimi. But either MailChimp or Mad Mimi, they're both really easy to use. Um, I think it could potentially be a good idea to collect um, email an email list because that's a list that you completely own yourself. Uh, I watch a lot of marketing videos and, for example, followers on Facebook, followers on YouTube. I mean, um, Instagram, I think we all know that all of our followers are not seeing every single one of our photos, uh, but your newsletter is sort of a, a targeted market. Um, generally, a, a good percentage of your newsletter followers 
do o actually see and open the newsletter. So news newsletters are a good idea, and I think Med, uh, MailChimp has a certain amount for free, so a uh, good idea, especially in-person events. Also, you can collect uh, email newsletter, um, email subscribers for that. It's a good idea, something to think about for especially repeat customers. Jana says, what machines do you use? All right, so let's start at the top of the list. Shannon, what's your sewing machine that you use mainly, at least? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to pick just one? <laughs> uh, my, it depends on what I'm doing. Uh, obviously, my, my piecing work, I, I have a, I'm a fan of Bernina. I love their machines. I think they're beautiful and they run really well. Um, also, a Juki. I noticed a couple of these ladies are sitting in front of their Jukis. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have a Juki serger. Really, it depends on what I'm doing. My, um, my main machine that I use is a Bernina 7 Series. Okay. Um, and then a Juki also. Okay, what about you, Christy? Uh, Juki 2010Q. Okay, how about and you, Dina? Oh. The machine I have, so. <laughs> yeah, I mostly use my Juki. Um, it's a DNU 1541. It's a beast. Um, but I was I was drooling earlier over Beth's cylinder arm machine, <laughs> so that's my next, uh, that's my dream machine, is to have an industrial cylinder <laughs> What about you? What do you? Uh, I see the Juki uh, back there. Yes, Juki eighty seven hundred, and then um, a cylinder arm that's from the leather company. It's a class twenty six, and it just came on a a um, fully mounted, and it was eighteen hundred. So, if anybody is able to get to Springfield Leather Company in Springfield, Missouri, they have them available there, and awesome. they, I'm sure they could ship them somehow. I don't know, but <laughs> I'm sure it could be shipped too. But awesome. it was a great deal on it, and it wasn't even on sale. That's just their regular price. Awesome. So. Um, Nikki says, what is the difference between custom and made to order? Um, and anybody can answer that on the panel. Um, to me, it's the same thing. So for me, um, the difference was that made to order is something I've already designed a bag for. So I made, you know, gig bags for the most part. So I have a soprano ukulele, a tenor ukulele, a acoustic guitar, full size, half size. These are made to order because the people choose the fabrics they want from my collection and I make that bag design. Um, for me, custom is when I go literally back to the drawing board. I get the measurements of their instrument. If it's something unusual, I need a tracing. Um, and I literally design the bag around um, those measurements and the shape and this, the weight. And I you know, decide what kinds of foam and all this stuff. Um, that I'm going to be teaching soon, actually. Um, that's for me, you know, what I call custom. Okay. Yeah. So it's different because you're making it for specific items. I gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Okay. So on that note, we're going to end that there. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. I know there were some really great ones coming through. Um, feel free to ask the question later on in the Facebook group, and maybe we can continue the conversation there and other people can chip in. But I want to thank my panel so much. I know Christy left already. I want to also thank Dina, Bethany, uh, Christy from Rock Baby Scissors, and Shannon. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks for sharing your information and answering questions. I really appreciate it. And I hope that uh, this was helpful to some of you out there that were considering making handmade items and selling them, or maybe you already do and you just needed um, a little bit of extra um, you know, uh, incentive to keep going with that. So um, thanks everyone so much. Um, this has been Ask Sarah. I'll see you again uh, next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time. Have a great rest of the week and happy sewing. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice meeting you guys.